This is a hind quarter of beef rail breakdown video. I don't do any fabrication into retail cuts in this video, just rail breakdown into subprimals. To set the scene, let me zoom out for a moment. I work at a small cut and wrap facility. We do USDA mobile slaughter as well as USDA cut and wrap. This means that we slaughter beef, pork, lamb, and goats at their farm of origin truck the carcasses back to the coolers at our stationary cut and wrap facility and then after an aging time period our meat cutting and meat wrapping crew fabricates each carcass into retail portion cuts such as steaks and roasts grind sausages stew meats stir fry etc we box and and freeze these cuts and the next day the farmer will come to pick up their boxes of frozen cuts which they then are able to sell at grocery stores and farmers markets, etc., because they are USDA inspected product. They got the the bug on them, which is the USDA stamp. I'll go for the flank section. The matambre muscle being first. Matambre is a South American word, which means to kill hunger. There is a popular roast made from rolling stuffing with vegetables and then slow cooking this cut. Now, why am I peeling the flank steak in this way? Why do I even bother with the matambre cut, you ask? I could remove the, the entire flank primal, throw it on the table. Wouldn't that be easier? Wouldn't that be quicker? Well, yes and no. The idea of easier is a very relative idea. The specific situational demands of our work environments will dictate what we do at the rail and at the cutting table. In this case, my cutting team prefers that I peel the flank at the rail so they don't have to mess with it on the block. I'm cutting as part of a team, so we have to cater to each other's preferences. The goal is a smooth workflow and high quality end result in the package. The details of how we reach this goal will look slightly differently on a case-by-case -case basis. Cod fat is just a chunk of fat that is located where the steers balls would be where the testicles would be of course steers don't have testicles if they did they wouldn't be steers they would be a bull a steer will have some fat laid down and that's called cod fat in the case of a heifer which is a young female it'll have fat there as mammary tissue and such that'll also need to come off at this stage I really like suet fat, kidney fat. You can tell a lot about an animal from looking at the suet fat. Some animals will lay down a ton of kidney fat. Some will barely have any at all whatsoever. Uh, it's a nice, chalky, hard fat. Not good for putting in your grind, uh, but definitely good for pointing in the direction of things like soap and candles and a variety of other tallow-based product. The psoas major, which is the tenderloin, uh, actually connects to the femur, and it gets thinner as it gets closer to the femur. The first thing I do is dig my knife through the top of that tenderloin right into the ball and socket joint, and I'm trying to dig the point of my knife into that hip socket. And then from there, I score down either side of the iliac, which is the pelvis bone, and I'm gonna peel that so as major down towards the lumbar section, and then I will disconnect that short loin with the tenderloin attached to it. I'll disconnect that from the sirloin, which is in the sacral vertebrae area. One person might do most of the breaking one day. One, another person might do most of the bandsaw work. A third person might do most, most of the portion cutting. Especially when it comes to portion cutting, it helps to have most of the portioning done by one person to maintain a consistent end result. With the tri-tip attached to the sirloin, I'm going to separate the sirloin from the round. I'm cutting through the bottom of the sirloin tip to create a ball tip, 
and then I'm following below the greater trochanter, which is a protruding part of the femur bone. I'm going below that with my knife, and my knife is coming out above the sacral vertebrae. How high above or below, some people will break, make that cut below that sacral vertebrae. That all depends on your end goals. So I'll tend to go three inches above the, sac the last sacral vertebrae in order to get a bigger sirloin cap, culotte, picanha muscle. The sirloin breaks off at the crest of the iliac, which in this case we see a little bit of cart cartilage laid down that I'm able to uh, snap off and break through with my knife, signifying uh, uh, this animal was more than likely less than three years old, probably less than two years old. The more cartilage that's there and the easier to cut through that is a sign of a younger animal. If it were an older animal, I would have to use a different strategy because that cartilage would have ossified and would be bone at this point. I would need to cut around that as opposed to cutting through that. Here the oyster steak gets scooped out of the pelvic bone in preparation for removal of the entire hip bone. This is one of the more wild things we do as butchers is dealing with hip bones and the ball and socket of the hip joint. Um, the hip bone has so many hills and valley and nooks and crannies. It, after I score around the pubic symphysis area, I go right for the hip socket, the cup of the hip socket, where the ball of the femur, or the head of the femur fits in. This is called the, well, the socket is called the acetabulum. And you have to cut through there because it's quite tightly attached with a ligament that you have to be able to cut through and once you've done that, you have to go to the other side of the hip bone, which is where the sits bone is located. The sits bone is the tuber ischii, is what it's called. Once that pops out, your job is mostly done for removing that pelvis. Now I'm going for that top round, finding the seam uh, between the eye of round on one side and sirloin tip on the other side, peeling it down towards the ground. After that, I will focus on sirloin tip and bottom round and eye round all coming off in one piece. Um, I've done this a variety of different ways over the years, but currently this is just how I do it. Why Latin names? Why do I go heavy on the Latin and scientific names in this video? Well, in short, because anatomical names provide a comprehensive common language in butcher language, there is no words for most of the bone, muscle, and sinew features on a carcass. Furthermore, butcher language is very regional, so it is easy to get mired in too many names for the same cut. Too many names is just as much of a problem to my mind as no name. It's hard to communicate when, in, when a cut goes by six different regional names in the same way that it's hard to communicate when there is no name for a bone feature or a muscle, etc. Anatomical names provide us with many of the names we need to talk about this stuff remotely. If we were standing next to each other in the butcher shop, I could just point and grunt and you would get the idea no language would be needed. Another reason is that anatomical names bring me up out of my butcher tunnel vision and into a wider conversation, which is a conversation about mammals as a whole, humans included in this. I find my own anatomy mirrored to me as I dive deep into quadruped anatomy, which is four-legged creature anatomy. The muscles and anatomical structures of these animals I butcher are almost nearly identical to my own anatomy. As it turns out, Whales and giraffes, humans, mice, and really all of the of mammals are remarkably similar on the inside. Furthermore, the language of anatomy opens me up to a curiosity about animal behavior and locomotion and the lives lived of these animals. It bridges me more deeply to seeing things from the animal's perspective and perceiving the stories from their lives as I work. Latin names also provide a bridge to veterinary and related 
animal science disciplines, which are fascinating in their own right. I was originally attracted to meat cutting because of the craftsmanship and artistry involved, but also because of the relevance of the work. Butchers are the linchpin between the farming world and the culinary world. Farmers can bring the fruits of their labors to market because of the help of butchers, and families in the community can furnish their dinner tables because of the help of butchers. It's meaningful work. We run a crew of two slaughtermen, two to four meat cutters, and two to four meat wrappers. We might cut four to six beef a day or 30 lamb maybe or 16 hogs on average in an eight-hour period. Maybe this sounds like a lot to you. Maybe this sounds like a little. From our perspective, we, we certainly have plenty of work to do most days, but compared to the custom-exempt sector and also the packing house sector, we are considered small. 